Welcome back. I'm the Intense MD, a double board certified intensivist, here to give you an inside look into the intensive care unit. And special welcome to the 30 people who have decided to subscribe to my channel. I'm very excited to have 30 subscribers. I know that's not a huge amount, but I'm grateful for anyone who has decided to come along with me for this ride. So today is a much anticipated video. I had a Q&A a couple weeks ago on my Instagram page and I received a question about ECMO and I said, you know, this is a more intense topic that I didn't want to just answer in a couple Instagram stories of text. I said, do you guys want to hear a video about this? And y'all said, yes, we do. So here it is. So we typically think of ECMO as a bridge. So this is either a bridge to recovery from whatever the underlying process is or a bridge to an organ transplant. There are two types of ECMO. There is VV ECMO, which is venovenous, and VA ECMO, which is venoarterial. There are other situations where we can do VAV ECMO and add oxygenators and all this fancy stuff, but for the purpose of this video, I'm trying to keep it simple. There's two types of ECMO. So venovenous ECMO, I'm sure you can figure out, this means vein to vein. And the easy way of thinking about this is it essentially bypasses the lungs. We put cannulas either in the vein in the neck, and it has an inland outlet port, or you can put one in the neck, one in the groin. Either way, there's one port pulling blood out and one putting blood in. And like I said, once the blood leaves the body, it gets oxygen from the device and then put back into the body. The A ECMO, we bypass the heart and the lungs. So this goes from vein, where the blood goes out, gets its oxygen, and then when it gets put back into the body, it gets placed into the arterial system, bypassing the heart. So what are the reasons why we would put someone on ECMO? So if somebody's going on VV ECMO, we can start with that. It's usually for severe respiratory failure, hypoxic respiratory failure, essentially meaning that the lungs aren't working, we're not able to give them enough oxygen through the ventilator, so we are going to use this external device to put oxygen into their blood that way. But for VV ECMO, the bottom line is the lungs aren't working properly. Now for VA ECMO, there are several indications for that as well. One reason we would put someone on VA ECMO is if they are going on VV ECMO, but we look at their heart and it looks like they might have some heart failure or reduced heart function, we'll consider VA ECMO. Some cardiac specific reasons for VA ECMO are heart failure, if somebody had cardiac arrest, which means the heart stopped, we have a decent idea of, of why and it's a reversible cause, we would put them on VA ECMO. This needs to happen very early in the cardiac arrest. There's a recent study done for pulmonary embolism, which are blood clots in the blood vessels in the lungs. And this showed a benefit to placing those patients on VA ECMO if they are having what we call hemodynamic instability. We may also place somebody on VA ECMO for abnormal heart rhythm or if they're waiting for a heart transplant or some type of cardiac device like I spoke about in my last video. So this sounds like a miracle machine, right? Like, why wouldn't we place somebody on ECMO? It sounds like it does exactly what we'd want to do for them. And why can't we just do that for everybody? Well, there's a lot of reasons. Well, first of all, somebody would have to go to an ECMO center not all hospitals do ECMO. Sometimes they'll place somebody on the circuit and then transfer them to a center that is an ECMO center, but sometimes some places don't offer that at all. So resources are limited. There's only a finite amount of circuits in one hospital. And I remember seeing on the news up in Seattle at the beginning of COVID, they were rationing the ECMO circuits and they had very, very strict criteria for this because they only had so many circuits to go around. One of the biggest things we look at though is the reason why this, this person's in respiratory failure, or the reason why their heart's not working, is this something that's reversible? Because if it's not reversible, then there's no reason for this patient to go on ECMO as life support. Because it's not a treatment, it's 
just life support. So if they have a process that's not going to get better, then we cannot offer them ECMO because what ECMO does is buy us time to fix the problem. And we do have different metrics and scoring systems and criteria that we look at as clinicians to determine if this person will benefit from ECMO or not. Um, I'll just post here, you know, our scoring system, but it is a very complex process and multiple physicians and subspecialists are involved in this decision making. It's not a unilateral decision. Usually, you know, I'm calling a cardiologist or a cardiothoracic surgeon and saying, you know, can you evaluate this person for ECMO? I have seen ECMO done in pregnant patients, so pregnancy is not a contraindication. It's, you know, always stressful to have a pregnant patient in the intensive care unit, but um, there are situations where pregnant women do go on ECMO. Like I said in previous videos, there's nothing that comes without a risk. So what are the risks of going on ECMO? One of the most common ones I've seen is bleeding. Bleeding in the brain, bleeding into the lungs, just bleeding out of the lines. And, you know, one of the reasons for this is when you have a circuit like that, that's, you know, bringing the blood out of the body, putting it back into the body, that circuit can form clots. So we give a blood thinner, typically heparin, to avoid the circuit from clotting off. So if someone's life support device isn't working, then you have bigger problems. Something else that can happen related to heparin use is something called heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. A very oversimplified explanation for this is heparin can cause the body to form antibodies and those antibodies work against platelets and destroy the platelets. So we have to stop giving heparin and give a different type of anticoagulation, but in the meantime, somebody's platelet counts low, that's a higher risk of bleeding. And people with this condition, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, can also form blood clots. So they can bleed and they can clot. Clotting obviously is another risk of being on an ECMO circuit, as I've discussed previously. There's always the risk of, you know, the catheter causing issues to the structures inside the body, usually when we're doing a procedure where you know, we're putting something, a line, a tube, a drain into a patient, one of the risks that we say is, you know, harm to surrounding structures. It's very rare that this happens. I don't know if I've ever seen an injury related to an ECMO cannula, but that's not to say it's never happened. And something else that I warn patients when we do procedures, again, where we're putting something external into the body, is this is a portal for an infection to get in. So, you know, we monitor these patients for infection, we make sure the lines are clean, the sites are clean, that these procedures are done under sterile conditions, but there's always the risk of infection when you have something from the outside coming into the body. So this was a very quick and dirty, overgeneralized explanation of ECMO, but hopefully it's provided some clarity for those of you who've just heard about it on the news and have never heard of ECMO before and just wondering in general what it is. If you have any questions about ECMO, let me know. Um, I'll be happy to address them in the comments or make another video if it warrants that. I'll be back on Friday for a reaction video or some type of fun video. I have not decided yet. Mm -hmm.